In this video we're going to discuss a very important high yield topic uh, called deep venous thrombosis also abbreviated DVT and DVT is a very very high yield uh, topic so I'll try my best here. Uh, well what is DVT? Uh, it is a blood clot and uh, blood clots uh, the more uh, scientific term of course is known as a thrombus and it's a blood clot that most commonly occurs in the the legs e either uh, presenting in the calf or thigh and the reason it's so important and the reason that it should be taken very seriously is that as much as 50 percent and that actually is very high because I thought it was about 30 percent but um, I just recently read that as high as 50 percent of the time a DVT can progress to a pulmonary embolism and uh, I'll, t I'll talk a little bit more about that um, of course but I just wanted to briefly mention that to illustrate the seriousness of this so before I get into everything I'd like to show a little diagram to sort of illustrate what's going on so here of course you have a diagram of a, a person's uh, legs and they're showing uh, the calf muscle and this first diagram is normal this is a normal uh, uh, vein that's in the leg and as you can see those little red things are blood blood cells and they're flowing really nice and this thing right here is a is a valve and blood and veins uh, is uh, go traveling back up um, so that it can go back uh, to uh, into the circulation and of course um, this big clump right here that clearly looks abnormal are thrombi thrombus is the singular and thrombi would be the plural and thrombi essentially are blood clots blood clots now what can happen is um, eventually one of these can branch off into something like that and move up the circulation and that once it uh, once a thrombus uh, starts to move it's known as an emboli embolus being uh, singular and emboli being plural so why is this important well this one of course is normal the second scenario is really the DVT deep venous thrombosis deep venous thrombosis because it's in the deep veins of the legs and you're talking about a thrombus if this happens this third scenario that's when you get the PE pulmonary embolism what does that mean that means that this emboli right here travels all the way to the lungs that's why it's called pulmonary embolism and if it travels to the lungs that's a major problem because that can lead to death this blood clot can travel to the lungs and block uh, uh, vital uh, uh, process of uh, oxygen exchange and that can lead to death and that, that is so significant that DVTs are taken very seriously so that's really a, a nice little diagram that kind of explains what's going on. Okay, so before I get into symptoms, I really need to talk about etiology because etiolo etiology is actually tested more often than symptoms are. And there's something very, very important to remember, and that's called Virchow's triad. Virchow's triad, as the name implies, is three things that can cause DVT that's an etiology also known as cause and first I'll, I'll list uh, those three things and then I'll talk a little bit about it this is very important um, because like I said it's often tested uh, more than any other aspect of DVTs is the cause of the DVT alright so here we go well let's explain each one stasis is one of the causes of DVT. So what does stasis mean? Stasis is really talking about a patient in which the blood flow is not occurring like it should. So 
by definition, you know, instead of the blood flowing nicely because of um, the person being mobile, the 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 blood has a tendency to stay where it is and not flow properly, and that can lead to a, a thrombus, blood clot. And why would a person have stasis? Well, there's certain conditions, immobility, people that are bed bound, you know, that they just don't move around, they just lie in bed for either they're very ill or they just had a surgery or something like that. Another reason is, uh, uh, and, you, and this is very classic, is long car or plane rides where a person is just sitting for hours and hours. And um, stasis is uh, a very big problem in elderly people uh, because they uh, are often very immobile. So that's one of the big three reasons uh, a person can develop DVT. Immobility, the blood's not flowing like it should, stasis. Second one is endothelial injury. What does that mean? Well, basically it means that there's some sort of injury or trauma uh, usually to uh, uh, the, the leg and that sets off a cascade that develops a blood clot. And in, in particular, the, it's the endothelial uh, endothelium that's injured or, or damaged in some way and, and, and in repairing it, the body sets off a cascade that develops a blood clot or several blood clots and unfortunately that can cause a DVT. The final one, hypercoagulability, refers to a inherent blood disorder uh, that a person has, uh, oftentimes is born with, that makes it so that the person has a much higher probability of forming blood clots. And there's several uh, inherent uh, uh, blood disorders. Um, there's a protein C deficiency. Um, there's a Leiden V factor. Um, there's quite a few. There's antithrombin 3 the deficiency. And what these uh, inherent blood disorders do is they create hyperviscosity and that leads to a higher chance that a person will form blood clots compared to the regular population. And these three things together are known as Virchow's triad. Very important to remember. Remember it uh, always. Um, there are of course a few other reasons why a person uh, chance of developing a DVT can increase and they include smoking, oral contraceptive pills, hormone contraceptives, cancer, and pregnancy. Uh, these can also lead to uh, DVT or increase the chance, uh, increase the risk uh, of developing blood clots in the lower, um, in the lower extremities. Okay, so now we can move on to symptoms. What are the symptoms? Well, the symptoms really are, are calf pain, and of course I, I'm referring to uh, if the DVT does occur in the calf, which most commonly it does. Calf pain, the tenderness, you know, when you palpate, for sure. Uh, swelling, uh, it will be definitely uh, edematous, swelling, edema, you know, that kind of goes hand in hand. And it will be red, erythema. And it, might, and, and, and it will also be warm to the touch. Man, those are really, it is pretty classic. If you've seen enough of these, you can definitely look at it and say, yeah, that's most likely a DVT. There's another physical exam finding that um, is very popular. It's called Holman sign. And what that means is you ask the patient to uh, dorsiflex um, there at the ankle, and that will uh, elicit uh, calf. Uh, pain, home and sign. And if this indeed does the blood clot, let me just draw a little blood clot in here. If it indeed does travel all the way up to the lung and you do indeed get a pulmonary embolism, then you will have more symptomatology that are no longer limited to the calf. And those symptoms include shortness of breath and uh, pleuritic chest pain. 
Pleuritic chest pain refers to chest pain when a patient takes a deep breath. If a person has that, you know the person is in big trouble and they really need uh, treatment immediately and, and uh, I will definitely go into what the treatment is. So how do you diagnose DVT? Well, there's a classic uh, uh, test. It's called lower extremity venous Doppler ultrasound or if you just want to say ultrasound, ultrasound of the lower extremity. And that will definitely show you, indeed, the patient has a blood clot in the legs. There's another test that's done. It's not a very, uh, it's not a very specific test, but it can be done. It's a D-dimer. And that basically shows that there's a presence um, of uh, thrombi. But uh, this is by far the, the one that you're going to order for sure. And then um, if indeed you are suspicious that the patient does uh, have uh, a pulmonary embolism, then you need to do a, a CT of the chest. Yeah, and there's no doubt about it. And that spiral CT of the chest to show that the blood clot has traveled all the way to the lungs. And uh, that that is a very, very serious uh, complication of DVT. All right, so now we, we're into the treatment. The treatment of DVT is essentially just anticoagulation. You are giving anticoagulants with the hope that these will break those clots and um, that the clots will no longer uh, develop into emboli and move and travel up the circulation. So initially what you do is you give uh, these uh, heparin products uh, usually like a um, inoxaparin. Uh, that's a very, very commonly used uh, heparin product. It, uh, it's also known as low molecular weight heparins. Low molecular weight heparins. And then later, uh, that's followed by warfarin. So that's usually the, the, the way it's treated. And what's important to remember is that warfarin um, is given for a certain duration and it's usually given for three to six months but sometimes it can be lifetime uh, if the patient has for example recurrent DVTs or if the patient has a um, hypercoagulability uh, and we talked a little bit about that earlier with Virchow's triad where the person has a known risk factor that is not modifiable, meaning they're always going to have it. So since they always are going to have this hypercoagulability in their blood, you need to put them on warfarin for life. Um, there's one very important uh, treatment modality I want to uh, mention. It's called the inferior vena cava filter. Why is this important? Well, this is very important because some patients you cannot give blood thinners. Uh, there, some patients have um, contraindications uh, for hyper for anticoagulate therapy. So you you can't give them anticoagulant therapy. Uh, for example, if somebody has like a uh, let's say a bleed of some kind, they have intracranial bleed, let's say, and um, they come in with a DVT. Uh, you know, these kinds of scenarios can happen. Any scenario in which their anticoagulant therapy is contraindicated, they already have a bleed going on, you can't give them uh, a heparin or warfarin products because it will worsen the bleed. So then how do you treat it? Then you'd have to put in this inferior vena cava filter. And basically it's a, a filter that um, is placed in the inferior vena cava uh, just below the renal veins and it's placed via catheterization um, and uh, it's uh, placed uh, so that the thrombi uh, don't actually um, travel up into the circulation into the lungs preventing uh, complications from these emboli. After a surgery, and this is important and many of you have already seen this in, in your hospital rounds, they place these uh, compression uh, devices they're known as pneumatic compression 
uh, devices on the patient's legs and that is uh, done in an attempt to decrease the probability of a DVT as these will do that they will help alright now we'll get into a couple of clinical vignettes so here we go 39 year old very healthy and functional woman is scheduled to undergo a right total hip replacement after she suffered a femoral head fracture two days ago during a fall while climbing a flight of stairs. She has no significant past medical history and takes no routine medications. She is scheduled to have her operation in the morning and you are called as a medicine cons consult to make any appropriate recommendations. Post-operatively, this patient is at greatest risk for developing. Okay, well, pretty good question. Well, let's t see. She's going to be undergoing surgery. And um, afterwards, uh, surgery, you know, causes trauma to the to the local uh, area, and then she most likely, after this uh, hip replacement, will be immobile for some period of time. Well, does any of this kind of ring a bell? Well, this. These two are part of Virchow's triad. If you remember, stasis, because person is immobile, and endothelial uh, injury or damage because of trauma. And Virchow's triad, if you remember, were three reasons why a person can develop DVT, deep venous thrombosis. Yeah, it's a good question. And finally, this one, which um, the answer choices I wasn't able to squeeze in, but I can always uh, write them in. 76-year-old um, man is admitted to a medical ward three days post-subdural hematoma drainage. So he had a, a bleed inside his skull. C3 cervical spine fracture and fixation of multiple extremity fractures sustained in a motor vehicle accident. The patient is now awake and oriented to person, place, and time, but is a lower cervical spine incomplete quadriplegic. Physical exam reveals... Some minimal sensation in the legs, but no ability to move his extremities. There is a Foley catheter in place that is draining yellow-colored urine. Doppler ultrasound demonstrates a thrombus in the left popliteal vein. The most important step in management is, well, let me uh, put in the answer choices here, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, we've got um, heparin. We've got uh, the inferior vena cava filter we've got warfarin and we've got something called uh, plasminogen all right this is a very good question because immediately you think well he's got he's got a DVT give him anticoagulants so heparin and then warfarin but this is one of those uh, the questions where the patient is uh, contraindicated for anticoagulants. Why? Because he just had a bleed, subdural hematoma. So if you remember, if a, someone is contraindicated to anticoagulant therapy, you give this inferior vena cava filter. And I'll write it out for you. Inferior vena cava filter. So, good clinical vignette.